Today, we are talking about overcoming anxiety. Today, we are talking about overcoming anxiety. Now, anxiety, it doesn't seem like it is one of the major issues that we're dealing with today. And I think if I took a poll of each one of you in here, you would say, yep, my problem, right? I know I could deal with anxiety. And so what I want to do is this introduction is going to be a little bit longer than what it normally is, but it's because I want us to all be in the same understanding to understand what I'm talking about when I say the word anxiety, okay? So we're going to take some time to define it, take some time to understand what we're dealing with, because you got to know your enemy before you could overcome it, amen? And so what is anxiety? Anxiety is the anticipation of a future concern. It's not something you're dealing with right now. It might be triggered by something you're dealing with right now, but it's when you allow your mind to wander into future concerns. And let me tell you, when you start worrying about future concerns, these future concerns become unrealistic concerns. You guys understand it, Pastor, this morning? It's a future concern that when you focus on those future concerns, they become unrealistic concerns. What's happening is you begin to think about what can happen and you treat the things outside of your control, things that don't even exist right now, as immediate and urgent concerns. But the truth is, when it comes to anxiety, nothing's actually happened. There is a distinct difference between anxiety and concerns, okay? Concern has to do with what is right in front of you. While anxiety has to do with what maybe could happen but probably not. Let me give you an example. You drove your car here this morning or you rode with somebody who was in a car and you got a flat tire concern would tell you I need to pull over and I need to put on a spare tire makes sense here's a problem right in front of you here's something that we can fix anxiety would say oh you got a flat tire well what else could go wrong what if you were flung off the highway and did a barrel roll into the fence and the barricade and then now you can't walk and you can't do all these other things to now a flat tire turns into or scared to drive you can't even do that anymore you see the difference one is right in front of you maybe has something you could do to fix it the other one is a future concern that you allow yourself to think about until it becomes honestly an unrealistic concern David Jeremiah has to tell us or tells us this anxiety usually has to do with the future which we have no control and concern usually has to do with the present and there are usually some things we could do in the present to take care of the problem so what does anxiety affect while concern might get your heart pumping it might get your brain moving and it might feel bad for just a second anxiety really starts to take over everything it not only affects your thoughts but these thoughts spill over into your emotions and even your health and I know this is a problem I've read a lot of statistics for you let me bring up a statistic that I read for you back in February this is still this year but the CDC came out with a report of the extreme mental health conditions that we're finding specifically in teenage girls today Three out of five teenage girls said they have felt persistently, that means day by day, sad and hopeless. They wake up hopeless, they go to sleep hopeless, and in between, they're hopeless. Three out of five. That's most. If you see a group of girls at the mall doing their girl mall thing, most of those girls statistically are sad and depressed and hopeless. In fact, it's so dire that the CDC has come out with this. 
It, it was so urgent for them because the situation is so dire. 30% of teenage girls say that they have had real serious consideration about dying by suicide. Three out of ten. You want to ask if anxiety and depression and stress is a problem? Look at that. And this isn't from, you know, the National Enquirer. This is from the CDC. This is all the information we could get, and they're all saying this is a big, big, big problem. And let me tell you, anxiety doesn't just happen in teenage girls. It happens in all of us. Let me tell you a story about a friend of mine in college to really illustrate what I'm talking about when I'm speaking about anxiety. I had a friend, and she was an extremely smart girl, top of her class in high school. And she began taking this biology class, and it was a pretty tough class. And the first grade that she got back was an A, but she had never scored so low in her life. I mean, she's a real top student. And so after receiving the lowest score of her life, which is still an A, by the way, which would be great for a lot of us, she started thinking. And she started coming up with what-if scenarios. She asked herself one simple question, what if I do worse the next time? Well, this one little question this germ of an idea began to grow and grow and grow. She started to ask questions like, what if I not only do worse, what if I fail the course? What if I lose my scholarships and flunk out of college? What if I never get to pursue my dream job? Well, if I can't pursue my dream job, what if I can never find a job? And what if my parents are super disappointed in me because they invested in me and now I've come up a failure? And if my parents are disappointed in me, what if the person who should be the love of my life is disappointed in me and doesn't want to date me, doesn't want to be with me? She begins to ask what if question after what if question until it takes its toll. Soon she was really doing bad. She wasn't sleeping. She wasn't eating. She lost a lot of weight. And then she actually started to panic when she had tests right in front of her. And so she wouldn't remember anything. And so this really brilliant girl had an A in labs, but was barely passing in her actual tests. Thankfully, she was able to get through the class and learned a lot in the process, but that's what anxiety looks like. Everything is going fine. The concerns in front of you really aren't that big. But you start asking, what if, what if, what if? Until all of a sudden, in your mind, you're in an unrealistic place, but it feels so urgent and it feels so real. This could happen to any of us. It could happen to teens. It, it can happen to singles. It could happen to new parents. It could happen when you change jobs. It could happen to brand new retirees. And it could definitely happen to older people. It can happen to all of us. So what do we do? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. Today we are talking about overcoming anxiety. So let me give you a little bit of a background of what we're diving into here in Matthew chapter 6. Right now, Jesus is giving something called the Sermon on the Mount. So what Jesus is doing is he's on the side of a mountain and he's speaking to the crowds and his disciples much like I'm speaking to you now. So he just has a bunch of lessons and things that people need to know to live a life like Jesus or like God wants them to live. More specifically, how to live a life that is dedicated to and pleasing God, free from hypocrisy, full of love and grace, full of wisdom and discernment. In other words, Jesus is telling you this is how you live your best life. This is the life you were created to live. And so he's going through all of this. And during this chapter, Jesus is talking a lot about your possessions. If you just look at the headlines, if you're looking at the ESV that I'm looking at, my headlines say, 
uh, giving to the needy. So he's talking about how you need to take some of your stuff and give to the people who don't have stuff. Uh, he then talks about the Lord's Prayer, which in the middle of the Lord's Prayer recognizes who's in control by saying, give us this day, because we can't get the day ourselves, and give us our daily bread, because we haven't earned it, couldn't get it ourselves. God has to give it to us. Then he starts talking about fasting. That's where you take your possessions and you go, I'm not dealing with this right now. I'm focusing solely on God. So whether that's food or TV or your cell phone, whatever it is, saying, look, I have this. I'm going to put it to the side and I'm going to focus only on God. Then he starts talking about laying up treasures in heaven. In other words, don't try and collect, collect, collect all you can here on earth. Man, start collecting for yourself things that will last for an eternity. Things that you could actually take with you to heaven. And so after talking about possessions and how we should deal with it on this earth, Jesus starts talking about our anxieties. Because honestly, if you're like most people, or at least if you're like me, I like to think I'm like most people, your anxieties do not stem from what's going to happen in heaven. If you've really accepted Jesus, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know where you're going. So I don't, I don't worry about that. Most of all of my anxieties have to do with what's going on right here and now on earth. And this is what Jesus has to say about it. Verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Well, thanks, Jesus. That's what you're going to have to tell me, man. Don't be anxious how was I supposed to help? I feel real anxious, right? I have all these worries. I have all these concerns. I have all these things that I'm dealing with. How am I not supposed to be anxious? Well, let me give you three ways that Jesus tells you that you can overcome this anxiety in your life. The first thing I want you to know is there is more to life. There is more to life. Let's see what Jesus has to say. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body. Now, let me pause right there. Those are some big concerns, right? I need to make sure that I have something to drink. I need to make sure I have something to eat. And I can testify nobody wants to see me without clothes. Amen. So those are big, big concerns. But listen to what he says. Is not life more? It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. What Jesus is saying in this first verse of telling you don't be anxious is stop focusing on the stuff that doesn't matter that much and start realizing that there is more to life. Most of our anxieties stem from the fact that we think that we can provide for ourselves instead of understanding that God is the one that provides everything for us. Remember last week I was talking about giving and about how David, he goes into this speech about why he could so freely give and how much of a blessing it is to give. This is what he says. He says, in your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all, which means that you can't give strength to yourself. Only God gives strength to you. Let me go on reading. It says, for all things. You know what that word all in the Hebrew means? It means all, everything. All things come from you. That means even the air you breathe, the food that you're going to eat after service, everything. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. There's nothing special about you that you could gather it for yourself. All things are given by God and God alone. So now Jesus is expressing, look, I know the things that you're anxious about. You know, forget about all the petty stuff. Let me just break it down for the most basic daily things. Every day I need to eat. Every day I need to drink. Pretty much every day I need to put some clothes on. So those are things we think about every day. And those are things that we can think about in the future, especially if you're 
uh, getting close to retirement. Do I have enough money that I have food for today? That I have, that I have something to drink? That I could at least go to the thrift store and buy some clothes from time to time? This is what he says. What, what, what Jesus is doing is he's trying to say, look, often in life we compartmentalize things, don't we? We say these are God things. These are things that God deals with. For example, me continuing to breathe. God kind of deals with the breath. God deals with the miracle type things. But then we have these other things that we go, okay, now these are my stuff. My bank account is my stuff. My job is my stuff. My, my hobbies, the things I collect, that, that's my stuff. And so we separate the two. What Jesus is poking and prodding, or what, a word that we use where I'm from, what Jesus is meddling with is all the stuff that you say is yours, that you think you take care of, that you think you control. And Jesus is saying, no. You're having anxieties about things that you don't actually control at all. And when it comes to our most basic things, food, drink, clothing, Jesus' comments are cutting, aren't they? He says, I see that you've been worrying about all these things. I mean, you've been legitimately anxious. Can't think about anything else. Staying up at night. Maybe even crying over these things you have anxiety over. Day in, day out. Maybe you feel like one of these teenagers that we see that the CDC has come out and report with. You feel hopeless day after day after day. And Jesus says, isn't life more than those things that you're worried about? Isn't life more than the things that you're anxious about? Because the truth is that God has bigger things for you. And you go, for me, Brent? Yes, every single individual one of you God has big awesome things that he wants to do with your life but the shame of it is is that we spend most of our life worrying about the things that don't matter there has been times in my life where I look at my bank account and I go I don't know what I'm going to eat I don't know but I'll tell you during those times when I did find something to eat, I don't remember what I ate. Maybe you've been there. Some of you guys have really grown up I impoverished. And maybe you can remember a meal or two that mom will whoop out out of like sand and water and like, you know, Vienna sausages or something like that. But for the most part, you don't remember what you eat day to day. I don't remember what I wore yesterday. Have no clue. I could maybe make some guesses. But it's because those things aren't big deals in fact when I talk to most people that are going through a hard time and they allow anxieties to take over most of the time when they finally get to the other side of it they go oh that wasn't so bad yeah because God was taking care of it it had nothing to do with you and in fact you made everything way worse by worrying about all these things that God had handled already Life is more than the things that you're anxious over. Those future concerns that are running through your mind. I'll give another example. I've uh, had the privilege of walking through life with so many people. Uh, from time to time I get a person that goes, uh, Brant, I'm in a dead end job. I hate it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, and I ask them, I'm said, you know, do you have enough money for like rent and food for the next three months? Yeah. I'm like, quit that job. What do you need it for? And you go, Brant, how could you be like that? They're suffering. Day in, day out, they have all these anxieties, all these worries about things that, honestly, if they quit, they'll find another job and God could actually use them and put them where they're supposed to be. And you go, Brant, that's a little radical. I'm trusting God. You know, we could use our minds. We need to look at the concerns that we have right now. But if your mind goes to, man, if I lose this job, then I'll never have anything. Trust in God. Can we just trust in God that he's going to take care of it so we can focus on the things that are bigger? 
Focus on the things that God really wants to do with you. So then we could trust God with the rest. Let me try and quantify what Jesus is really talking about here. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I here? Why am I here? Whatever your answer is for that, does God's purpose for you include worrying over many of the things that you worry about? No? Then why are we wasting our time doing it? Do you think that God has placed you here, died on the cross for you, given you the Holy Spirit, and provided his word for you to just be anxious day in and day out? Let me say this again. Jesus did not die for you on the cross. He did not rise again three days later. God has not brought you this far for you to fill your life with anxieties, with future concerns, things that are honestly unrealistic. God has a real purpose for you in your life. He does. And it would be a shame if you wasted your life anxious about things that God already has handled. Well, Brant, why do I not need to be anxious about these things? This is what we're going to see. It's because God is going to take care of you. God will care for you. Look at this. I promise. I I know that this sounds maybe a little bit too spiritual for some of you. All I'm doing is I'm reading what it says in the word, and I'm trusting that God keeps his promises. Let's look. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than these birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O little of faith? God will take care of you. Again, it's easy to trust God. Maybe some of the big things in our life. But it seems whenever we have the illusion of control, we think, you know what, God, this is mine. You don't have anything to do with this. So we don't go to God, we don't pray to God, and we sure don't trust in God over the things that he really does control. I mean, think about this. He says, look at the birds of the air. I have been around birds my whole life. Maybe you have too. And I have never seen a bird that looks like it died from starvation. Especially here, these are the fattest little birds I think I've ever seen in my life. I don't know where they're getting this food from, but they are being well fed. And what Jesus is saying is, look, God, if God takes care of these birds that don't have bank accounts, that don't make their own food, if God takes care of all of these things, What makes you think that he won't take care of you? And then he says, look at the lilies of the field. I love getting flowers for my wife, but the one problem with it is that after about a week, they die. Even if you have the most beautiful garden in all of Pueblo, winter comes, they die. And what Jesus says is, look at these flowers. Look how beautifully clothed they are. Now, do they have bank accounts? Do they have jobs that stress them out beyond all belief? Do they have all these anxieties that they're staying up all night with? No, not at all. But yet, Solomon, who had all the money in the world, would look at the flowers and say, how beautiful are those? Jesus' whole point is, if he takes care of the birds that are worthless, if Jesus takes care of the flowers, even though they live for such a short amount of time. What makes you think that he won't take care of you? Let's just think about for a second, can we? About how God has taken care of you 
so far. How valuable does God see you? Well, valuable enough that he gave you his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. I don't think he did that for the birds or the flowers. He did it for you. The God that when you believe in what Jesus has done, he doesn't just say, okay, you're saved, come in. Okay, could you just sit in the back of heaven? No, he adopts you as sons and daughters of his and says, your inheritance is everything. You get it all. He doesn't do that for the birds or the flowers. The same God that gives you the Holy Spirit to be with you at all times. The same God that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. It's the same God that values you way more than birds and flowers. God cares about what's going on in your life. God cares about the things that you're anxious about. But you know why God's not anxious about them? Because he's in control. He's already taken care of you. He's already providing for you. Man, if I, if I just didn't care about your time, I could stand up here and tell you testimony after testimony after testimony in my life, not even your guys' lives, my life, where I go, okay, God, you either need to show up or I'm going to be kicked out, right? And time after time after time, God provides in ways that I still can't believe. If God is caring for the birds and flowers, how much is he caring for you? Not just in the big things, but every small thing in your life, God cares for you. And to sum it all up, Jesus in the middle of talking about these birds and these flowers, he says, what will worrying get you? Nowhere. He says, of all the worries, all the anxieties, all the sleepless nights that you've had, has it made your life any longer? No, probably is taking quite a few years off your life, to be honest. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You could certainly lose years of life, but you do not gain anything. And one of the reasons, if not the definitive reason, you are worrying is because you have no control over the situation. Well, let me tell you, worrying isn't going to give you that control. What Jesus is saying is you could spend your whole life worrying about things that you should never worry about in the first place, or you could just trust that God's got it handled. Again, I'm not talking about the concerns right in front of you. There are things that you've got to take care of. If you've got that flat tire, just change that flat tire. Praise the Lord that you've got the spare. But when you start thinking about tomorrow, five years from now, ten years from now, when you start thinking about retirement, when you start thinking about all this other stuff, can we just start trusting God in some of these areas? This should make us ask the question, understanding that God is caring for us. God, if you already got this other stuff handled, then what do you want me to do with my life? That should be the question, because I don't know about you. It's easy to spend a lot of time being anxious over things that aren't going to happen. Jesus, if you already got everything else handled, what do you want me to do with my life? Here's the answer. Jesus gives it to us. Seek first the kingdom. That's what God wants you to do in every part of your life to seek first the kingdom read along with me therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the gentiles the people who don't believe in god is what he's saying the people who don't believe in god seek after all these other things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all in other words you're not going to go to god and be like i need Food. He'll be, say, yeah, I know I'm taking care of it. He already knows them all. But this is what you need to do. Not worry like the people who don't believe in God do. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Well, how do I do that, Brant? One day at a time. Look at what he says. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here's the thing that separates, the big thing that separates Christians from the rest of the world. 
we don't worry about the same things. People who do not have God try and fill their life with everything else. And so they're always anxious. They're always worrying. Because they don't know where it's all going to come from. They have to provide for themselves in their own mind. And how foolish is that? Because we know that we can't provide for ourselves. And so, yeah, I'd be anxious if I could figure out that I cannot provide for myself, yet every day I'm trying to provide for myself. That's super foolish. That's like me if it was like, I have to get in the NBA. <laughs> no chance. It don't matter how good of a shooter I am, no shot. Well, that's what they're living with. That anxiety day by day, they're having to do the impossible, really, in their mind because they have the wrong mindset. As Christians, we should have the right mindset. Shouldn't we? God is taking care of it. God cares about us. God loves us. He hasn't forgotten about us. He is providing blessings day by day by day. You don't believe it? You're here, aren't you? You don't believe it? Look at your bank account. Is there a penny in there? Great. God gave it to you. Did you have gas to get here today? A car to drive in? Do you have a spouse or somebody in this life who maybe even thinks about you from time to time? Do you have a job? God has given it to you. So we live with a totally different mindset. We live with a mindset of not survival, but thankfulness. When we trust God to provide and take care of us, it changes everything about our life too, doesn't it? It changes how we spend. It changes how we speak to other people. It changes our interests. And it even, get this, changes our prayers. So what do we do to replace all this worry? All this anxiety that everybody else is dealing with, but we have the mindset that God's taking care of us. We replace it by devoting our lives to God. By saying, I am going to seek God first. No more excuses, no, many, no more things sitting in the way. I'm going to double down on Jesus and I'm going to do everything that I can to follow him and trust that he'll take care of the rest. I was telling people in Sunday school this wonderful quote this morning, and you'll probably hear me say it more because I think it is so good. It's by Charles Stanley, and he says this. He says, obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. That makes life a lot more simple, doesn't it? Instead of trying to figure out what's going on over here and then what's going on over here and trying to balance the two. And it's not even two. It's like a hundred things you're trying to balance at once. Instead, why don't we just do our best to seek God first? To try and be righteous like he's told us to be righteous. And let him deal with the rest. That's so much more simple. That's why Jesus says, look, give me your worries. Give me your yoke because my yoke is easy. And it's light. Because it's not trying to figure out all the complexities of life. You do one thing. You follow God with what you got and trust that he'll take care of you every step of the way. What does it say what happens when we focus on God? He says all these things that you worry about, they'll be added to you. I'll take care of it. When we do what God tells us to do, we can allow God to take care of the rest. Simple. Well, how can we do that, Brant? Well, let me go through a couple of things that maybe you believe about God. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God has never left you and never forsaken you? Do you believe that he is all-powerful? If you've said yes, there's no more excuses not to follow him fully. If you've said yes, that he's all-powerful, he cares for you, and he can take care of it, no more excuses. Simple living. What does this mean? Does this mean that you'll end up with more health, more wealth, and more prosperity? That you'll get that promotion? No, that's not what that means. What it does mean is we do not have to count the cost too much. We do not have to come up with excuses. We do not have to do anything except for follow God and watch how he provides. That's a good, good life to live. God promises that he'll take care of you. 
And if that means that he takes care of all those things, all those anxieties that we live with, then we could say, God, what do you want me to do? And this is not a prayer once. This is a prayer we pray every day. God, you've taken care of me. God, you've provided for me. Thank you for providing for me. Now, God, since you're providing for me, what do you want me to focus on today? What do you want me to do today? Forget about tomorrow. Forget about what that looks like. Let that worry about itself. God, what do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do right now? Have you ever asked God that question, what do you want me to do? When you've asked that question, have you asked him with no limits, no excuses, and no holding back? If so, I believe God will begin opening doors and providing opportunities to use you in ways that you would never believe. When you allow God to handle the problems in your life, the anxieties in your life, and you just say, God, I'm going to focus on you, you are preparing yourself to be used by God and see the power of God in your life. So get ready for it. This is the main thing I want you to take home. Focus on God. Whenever you start to feel like that anxiety is brewing up, when you don't know what to do, can we just go to God and acknowledge, God, I know you've taken care of this, but I'm worried about this. God, could you help me through this? God, I'm obviously not busy enough focusing on you. God, could you, could you start to take away my anxieties and give me something else to think about? Something like you. God, I'm going to open up your Bible. I'm a, I'm, I know i got a lot of stuff going through my head. God, would you just begin to speak to me through your Bible so I can learn to focus on you and not focus on the things that you already have handled? Let me challenge you by asking this question. You need to ask yourself, how can I seek God first? And whatever the answer is, obey God and let him deal with the consequences. Understand how Jesus has already provided. Jesus, who created the whole world, that includes everything in it. He saw us in our sin and our shame, and he says, I want to rescue those people. Because they're focused on all these other things, and they're so far away from God, it's ridiculous. He says, I want to bring them back to God. I want them to have a relationship with me. I want them to live in the freedom and the lack of anxieties because they know the God who loves them is providing for them. So he came, fully God, fully man, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect life so that he would die on the cross, so that he would take care of the concerns for us. We didn't have to worry about him anymore. And he rose from the grave three days later in victory that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that's not all. God calls you worthy. God calls you a son and daughter of the Most High. He says, I have an inheritance for you. I have a love for you. And I'm going to take care of you. I want to ask that we start to consider what it looks like to live in that freedom, knowing that God's got it all handled. Let's pray. Thank you.